Well, I want to begin reading to you a tale that many of you maybe have read in the past. Maybe you studied it in high school. Maybe you picked this book up recently, but it's Charles Dickens wrote a famous story called A Tale of Two Cities. It begins like this. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness. It was the epic of belief, it was the epic of incredulity. It was the season of light, it was the season of darkness. It was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. We had everything before us, we had nothing before us. We were all going direct to heaven, we were all going direct the other way. Dickens was writing about a story about the French Revolution, a moment where re revolution was going to take over traditional values. And he wanted to tell a story set in that time that before them sat these two futures. The French were dealing with those two futures and trying to navigate what would this mean for them. Well, in 2022, I want to submit to you that we have two futures before us. And I'll share with you about those two futures and ask you to consider which future are you going to help build? You see, as we look at the future right now, we have lots of daunting challenges, right? We have challenges before us that speak to humanity, our future. We'll talk about many of those issues throughout these two days, whether it's the environment, genetics, technology, governments, war. These futures lie before us. And you know what, what is the role for us as Christians? in the midst of that kind of environment. Well, these two futures are very distinct. I want to paint a picture for you, not only in my words, but in the other's words who are leading this future, so that you can hear for yourself the future that is set before us by many in our world who I believe have good motives. I believe they have a desire to help humanity be better. But those motives aren't based in an understanding of God or necessarily an understanding of humanity. The one future I want to present to you that I believe many in our world, those who are leading at this point, believe would be the best future, I call man as machine. You see, in this future, man is looked at as matter, as a machine. It's a natural outgrowth of the social Darwinian theory that as globs of matter, we're just kind of here as machines. We're mechanical, soulless. And because of that view of the future, it means we need to do a lot of things to prop up humanity. We need to help humans be better. We need to do a lot to help them achieve all that could possibly be accomplished as human beings, but I'm not sure they're smart enough to do it on their own. Maybe there's some of us in leadership that need to help that along. And so when you start to get into that future, you start to want to understand what are we talking about here? What, what does that mean? In fact, for C.S. Lewis, he predicted this kind of future. This isn't just a new thing. This is something for over 80 years, those you've trusted, those you read about all the time, were predicting in their writings. I read from C.S. Lewis, The Abolition of Man. He says this, for the power of man to make himself what he pleases means, as we have seen, the power of some men to make other men what they please. He also goes on to say in another passage, the process which, if not checked, will abolish man. Traditional values are to be debunked and mankind to be cut out into some fresh shape at the will, which must be by hypothesis, an arbitrary will, of some few lucky people in one lucky generation which has learned how to do it. I want you to listen now to the World Economic Forum and how they describe it. Let's watch this. The very idea of human being Distinguish between what's natural and what's artificial. Inside our own heads is the most complex arrangement of matter in the known universe. You might ask yourself, can we get to be superhumans?
the original Industrial Revolution was driven by the discovery that you could use steam engines to do all kinds of interesting things. But that was followed by additional revolutions for electricity and computers and communications technology. We're now in the early stages of the fourth Industrial Revolution, which is bringing together digital, physical, and biological systems. One of the features of this fourth Industrial Revolution is that it doesn't change what we are doing, but it changes us. It doesn't change what we are doing, it changes us. You see, the ideology that runs along with this future is very simple. The, the goal is to perfect biology. It's to turn us into something better than we were designed to be. You have to actually listen to the people who are leading these movements. In fact, we're going to listen now to, in the own words of a New York Times bestselling author of Sapiens, Yuval Noah Harari. Let's listen to this. When Yuval Noah Harari published his first book, Sapiens, in 2014, about the history of the human species, it became a global bestseller and turned the little-known Israeli history professor into one of the most popular writers and thinkers on the planet. Yuval Noah Harari is talking about the race to develop artificial intelligence, as well as other technologies like gene editing that could one day enable parents to create smarter or more attractive children, and brain-computer interfaces that could result in human-machine hybrids. What is biometric data? It's data about what's happening inside my body. What we have seen so far, it's corporations and governments collecting data about where we go, who we meet, what movies we watch. The next phase is the surveillance going under our skin. Skin. You see, this future is about our biology becoming perfect. It's a picture of humanity that doesn't see God as knowing what he did and how he designed us, but us needing to perfect it. It's part of a future that describes transhumanism, something we've talked about in past culture summits and the idea of man wanting to create his own eternal life, live forever, scan our brains, use artificial intelligence to help us move into a new reality where the machines become part of who we are. If this sounds too dystopian to you, I beg you to listen more intently because this is the language, this is the way in which the leaders of our current world would like to see our future become. Now the emotion that's used to drive this is fear. We've noticed that over the last two years, how much propaganda and fear starts to drive us to maybe make some decisions that we otherwise thought with our critical minds maybe wasn't the best idea. And yet, because of the fear and the emotion driving it pushed us in that direction. Let's just watch a sample of some of the news clips over these last couple of years. Children and young adults said they expect climate change to have major implications for how they live. That's on top of growing research that shows young people are increasingly experiencing what's now known as climate anxiety. Los Angeles is dealing with a spike in brazen and sometimes deadly robberies. It's here now and it's spreading and it's going to increase. For unvaccinated, we are looking at a winter of severe illness and death for unvaccinated. For themselves, their families, and the hospital, they'll soon overwhelm. You see, fear is used consistently when you look at totalitarian regimes and that spirit that has moved over the last hundred years into different nations. We've watched it in communism, we've watched it in socialism. And the way in which it works is you create a lot of fear and then you back off. You create a lot of fear and then you back off. And it plays with our psychology. It starts to train us to think, man, things are much better now than they were three years ago. But haven't we been trained in a new way to start to think differently about what's normal, about what we should expect of one another, what we should expect of gathering with each other, of travel, of free will, of liberty? You see, these questions are new questions that we must grapple with. Fear becomes the tool. Just Mirlo, who wrote The Rape of the Mind in 1956, he was a psychoanalyst who, again, predicted where things might go with psychology as it relates to propaganda, says this, logic can be met with logic while illogic cannot. It confuses those who think straight. The big lie and monotonously repeated nonsense have more emotional appeal than logic and reason. While the people are still searching for a reasonable counterargument to the first lie, the totalitarians can assault them with another. You see, critical thinking is important. 
in this enterprise. Our ability to ask questions, to gather in groups, to have conversations, to learn from one another, to make sure I'm seeing it clearly. And if I'm not, that you can help correct me, that we can together start to form our opinions. Whereas when we start to get isolated, we no longer can think clearly. We actually start to move into echo chambers. We become rigid. The process of thinking and thought as it's designed by our creator goes away. Now the structure to advance this is coercive control. You see, the way in which this new future, man as machine, moves forward is coercion and control. And again, I'd like you to hear it in their words. Listen to where our economy is headed. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private, but what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. You see, when money starts to be controlled and where you can spend it and how it's distributed, currency is getting reset. Inflation on the rise. You start to position yourself as a nation, as a world, to come under the control of other people's ideologies. And I would submit to you that this future man as machine is the ideology. And that ideology competes directly with the ideology that we as Christians believe, which is a different future. It's a future that sees humans as divine creations. We are divine creations. We are made in the image of God. He gave us free will. He gave us the opportunity to choose, to decide what we would think and believe and who we would associate with and how we would gather. He gave us the ability to use innovation and technology and even to create it and design it, but all towards the purpose of helping human beings step further into God's design for them, not into enslavement to machines. And so as we think about the other future, I submit to you that part of that future is going to require us to double down on what it is that we believe theologically as Christians. So the first thing, when we look at our ideology or our theology, it's that we believe that we respect God's design. Genesis 1:27. so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them male and female. He created them. A simple scripture, we all know it, but do we believe it? Do we believe the way he's designed our systems to function are enough? Do we believe we need to be enhanced? Do we need the Neuralink from Elon Musk to implant in our heads so that we can play music in our brains? Do we need that? Is that an important innovation for the future of humankind? These are the questions being asked. These are the products being developed, being rolled out to you and your children in the coming year. So as you think about this future, I don't wanna leave you in a sense of this future is the future. See, I believe what God's done is he's created a different structure called the church. And this different structure has a different vision for the future. And this future is one of human flourishing. It's one that understands that God's designed us as creative individuals to partner with him and his spirit and what he's trying to do and what he's trying to unleash in the world. And when you don't see a God and you don't believe there's a God, you actually start to become your own God. And what we're dealing with in this man as machine future is leaders who see themselves as needing to replace God and make the decisions a God would make. But be not deceived, God will not be mocked. You see, in this other future where we know that we're divine creations, we walk with God, we partner with God, we go, how do we get creative and create what I would describe and what others over the last 50 years have talked about as a parallel structure? You see, the story goes back to the Czechs and a time when they were under communist rule and Vaclav Benda wrote this essay called The Parallel Polis. And in this essay, he described to his fellow neighbors, which ultimately it got banned, but it still got spread around and momentum started to grow. He explained to his neighbors that, look, we have to create our own parallel structures. 
We have to be the kind of people that create our own societies within our society. Not to remove ourselves so that we abandon the world, but we show up in the world, but we operate off of different virtues and value sets. We as Christians would operate off of a kingdom value set. A parallel structure is defined this way, a community that operates independent of state authority and creates economic, social, creative, educational, and spiritual value for themselves and all who wish to partake in an alternative culture. You see, I believe over these couple of days we're gonna talk about parallels. We're gonna talk about building the parallel and what does this parallel look like in the world? The Klev Havel, who later became the president of Czechoslovakia, once they were freed in 1989, once they realized that this parallel society was so powerful, made up of people planting their own gardens, new education systems beginning to educate the children, new forms of information being dispersed and media being shared, films that would work their way in from the West that started to create an imagination so that the people could continue to dream and believe that they mattered. And when he became president, he wrote this wonderful book called The Power of the Powerless. He says in that, what else are parallel structures than an area where a different life can be lived, a life that is in harmony with its own aims and which in turn structures itself in harmony with those aims? What else are those initial attempts at social self-organization than the efforts of a certain part of society to rid itself of the self-sustaining aspects of totalitarianism and thus to extricate itself radically from its involvement in the totalitarian system? See, Scripture's not far off when it describes a couple scenarios like this. I look to 1 Thessalonians 4, 10 through 12. It says, but we urge you, brothers, to excel more and more and to aspire to live quietly, to attend to your own matters, and to work with your hands as we instructed you. Then you will behave properly towards outsiders without being dependent on anyone. You see, this man as machine wants you to become dependent, dependent on the state, dependent on others to supply your needs to stop relying on our real provision, to not necessarily look to our family members or to the church or to our local communities and say, how do I share what I have? How do we in community start to work this out? You know, many are predicting world famine is coming, that we're gonna move into a season where food supply and shortages and grains are not gonna be making their way here as much as you've learned to live with in recent decades. We're moving into a season where I believe the church must become this parallel structure, not to isolate from the world, but to actually bring value to the world, to create new ways for the world to interact, to continue to remember who they are and whose they are and who we've been called to be. You see, it's in this building of the parallel that we start to create new education systems. We start to create gardens at our churches. We start to create new ways of sharing advice and information. We start to create new ways of of building entrepreneurial businesses that bring life to our companies, our employees, and to all those around us. You see, building the parallel is a future that I believe as Christians we must invest in. And not only will it help bring life to us, it's gonna bring life to our communities, it's gonna bring life to all those around us. And so as we begin these next couple of days, as we walk through the talks, the conversations, the interviews, as you meet new people, people, some that are Christians and some that are not, I want you to hear it through this lens of what is it that God might be calling us to create? What is the opportunity, what is the sign of life that we, we need to be a part as leaders of cultivating and creating for all those around us who are gonna long for it and need it? But as leaders, we have to be ahead. As leaders, we have to ask the Holy Spirit to help us see what is he calling us to do in the industry I'm in, in the local community that I'm in, in the neighborhood that I'm in, what is my role to be a part of creating the parallel? Thank you.